I'm sure we'll keep having some people showing up here, but let's uh, go ahead and dive in because why wait for the greatness? So happy Thursday. Welcome here. And thanks for joining us at Parent Lab for tonight's webinar on distance learning, which is the first of two webinars that we're going to be doing with our guest this evening, Dr. Jack Maple. Uh, I'm Zan Holston. I work at Parent Lab. I'm one of the audio hosts and reporters, and I will moderate this evening and help try to keep things as good as we can. So Jack is a, well, Dr. Maple, I should say, is, is a, a top-notch pediatrician and a cartoonist, uh, which is really the important part of all of it. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Maple is the vice chair of the pediatrics department and the director of comprehensive care programs at Boston Medical Center um, and associate clinical professor of pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, he is a widely published educator and a writer on pediatric issues. And as I said before, he really does do comics and cartoons, and hopefully we'll get to see some of that. At some oh, point. you will. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Um, that's all I've got. So Jack, why don't you go ahead and, and take over and let's get into this. That's great. Yeah, we can uh, flip it over to the slides and Gentry, I think I can drive here. You can, I'll absolutely shout out if I have some trouble. Um, yeah, that's nice. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, thanks for joining us. I know you're taking time out of a busy day, probably juggling kids, dinner, errands, work, etc. cetera. Um, just, just to embellish a little more on uh, Zan's kind introduction, I am a pediatrician. I'm a primary care doctor. I've worked, I've been in practice for about 20 years. Um, I principally care for um, kids who have special needs or complex or chronic illness. And so some of that will come through in our discussion this evening. Um, I did want to kind of walk folks through, um, you know, the issues that have arisen or we've that have and the areas of constant and continuous learning we've had since this whole thing began, uh, and then how it actually translates over to um, the the issues or the challenges we can have as parents and as pediatricians or as educators or as people caring for kids as members of our families or of friends' families. So. Um, I think what we'll do is I'll walk through a relatively brief overview, really intended to kind of frame the issues and maybe kind of get the juices flowing a little bit. I think we're all a little more interested in maybe some Q&A at the end where I'm very excited to take your questions and answer things to the best of my ability or as I often tell my families in primary care, I know a lot of smart people and I can get you answers. If not tonight, then I'm very happy to do so in writing or in some kind of back and forth later on, but we'll try to answer as much as we can this evening. You know, so I think um, big shock, we're gonna talk about some of the bigger or um, most profound disruptions to kids and families during the pandemic. Um, a lot of this won't be news to anyone on this uh, webinar, especially uh, that suggesting that because you're here suggests that this has already happened to you some, to some extent, or else you're just curious, or you had an extra hour to kill. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how the, the back to school transition, the new schedules and stressors can impact kids' physical and mental health. And not just that, but also I think six months of grinding uncertainty and disruption. And then when as parents, as caretakers, you need to seek su uh, extra supports outside your perhaps household or perhaps in a community or perhaps partner with someone to do further evaluation if you think there's something deeper or more concerning going on. And then before we're done, we'll try to talk about some strategies to address some common behavioral problems in response to lockdowns and that back to school stuff as, um, in, in 50 different states, done 50 different ways as, as school systems reopen and as communities re phase in reopening. Um, some are further along, some are further back. I am, for example, in Massachusetts and we're sort of like probably towards the back of the pack, um, which in some ways is good and in some ways is not as advantageous depending on your perspective or what you wanted to do that day. Again, maybe hold your questions for the end. I think if this was an in-person uh, encounter, um, it would be a, it would be a lot easier to do, but just do do hold your questions, write them down, and we'll go over them at the end. Zan will help us with that. So you know, really, what have we all seen? Let's talk about the life we've all had. That there's been a massive of disruption for all of us, but really, most especially our kids um, and the families they live in. You know, be it uh, preschool, um, early child care, early learning centers, or elementary or middle or high school, or even university. Um, there's just been a massive interruption of their routines. And then consequently for some of the, the folks who are the breadwinners in the family, there's been a loss of resources. So 
the inability to maybe um, maintain uh, tuition in a in a private school or a parochial school, perhaps, um, or a lack of um, resources have contributed to a cascade of events that have made it harder to access whatever domain or compartment of a kid's life was previously in place. That could be healthcare, it could be behavioral health, it could be an after school or boys and girls club, it could be other um, developmental or behavioral or psychiatric services which keep a kid whole and keep a family running. Uh, and you know, we've all seen and we've all worried about the disconnection that we have had as adults, but also the kids themselves from their peers, the services like I mentioned, um, as well as um, connections to the other adults in their lives, other therapists, other counselors or educators. And you know, I can tell you in primary care, we've seen some, some, some less significant and more significant impacts of the postponement of medical, dental and behavioral health visits. So little things like dental cleanings for kids with great teeth, not a big deal. For a kid who maybe is seven years old coming back for a check-in for a sports physical, that may or may not be important. But we, for, we, for the kids for whom we have known or complicated or chronic illness, be it something like autism, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, diabetes, asthma, for some of those kids not being checked in upon or not having access to things like immunizations or the ability to renew prescriptions has had sometimes profound or even catastrophic consequences. Not as much in the news, I think given the fact that a lot of the media coverage focuses on, rightly, the adult burden of COVID and, and coronavirus disease over the last six months. But I think, you know, these things are now sort of like a porpoise. They've been sort of skimming along the tops of the waves and increasingly evident over time that there really is something big going on here. So the consequences of prolonged lockdown can lead to stressors as, as we described. Um, and we have seen in even middle and sometimes even upper middle class families a, a change in financial status, which can be mild or quite severe, resulting in, in poverty or impoverishment uh, that can be long-term or temporary, loss of housing, loss of cars and transportation, and other supports. And then really for many families and kids, shared stress and feelings of isolation, sometimes from other family members and the fear of contagion, other times physical distance and all the other pieces that we're describing here. And then like a cascade, like dominoes, this can lead to less supports for the kids and then for those adults who care for those kids. So the adults themselves might be shouldering a burden, feeling the stress themselves, and then passing that on or creating an environment of background stress or tension in a household. You know, we, we truly have cons heightened concern for those who are most vulnerable amongst the kids who are themselves the most vulnerable segment of our population in tandem with the seniors. So kids with special needs, children in foster care, or those children who have a history of trauma or psychiatric problems have often felt this most most uh, acutely and most um, devastatingly. So that some of the consequences, you know, sort of put put differently, um, some good, some bad. So we have seen, um, you know, the gaining of the COVID-19, so, so-called 19 pounds, or not usually that much, but somewhere between five and 10 pounds for some kids over the last six months. I did have one child who gained 50 pounds. Um, we certainly have seen kids less active. Um, that's been the good and the bad of that. The good is fewer kids falling off of things, fewer kids having concussions and contact sports. Um, but we have some kids who were athletes and who had promising or burgeoning um, careers at any age um, cut short or frustrated by a lack of ability to, to get out that extra energy. You know, the less structured time poses a challenge and, a, and a, it's like a boon and a bane, right? There's at least initially everyone was watching Netflix, was watching a lot of screen time. I just stopped asking about how many hours of screen time every day because the answer was approaching infinity. Um, and we've seen some kids hit the wall of board, boredom. I think that was especially true in the in the spring and early summer before we um, before this got really long. And the, at least in the, the better cases, boredom became a reason for some kids to rediscover things that they used to be ha they used to be have to drag to. Kids started playing piano. Kids started coloring or drawing or sketching again. Kids started indulging in reading and doing other pursuits that you know normally they just didn't have time for because they were on their phones or they were playing a game. Um, we did see less Ill illness, ironically. So while adult disease sort of took off and was overflowing ERs and hospitals, we have had uh, fewer premature babies. We've had fewer kids suffering um, illnesses that have led them to the emergency room or admissions to hospitals. So pediatric services financially haven't done so well. 
from a societal perspective, that's fabulous. If you're running a hospital, eh, it's less desirable, but that's okay. I think the more important thing is kids are doing better. You know, I think in, in, in a message we always try to say to our kids, no matter what the weather, no matter pandemic or not, one easy and cheap thing that we can all access if we're able to, and if it's safe, and for example, there's not a forest fire for those of you living in troubled areas, you know, get outside if you can, because that can be a great way for kids to cost free, hopefully, uh, get out there and have some energy that's hopefully destructive and address their outdoor um, deficiency disorder. That's not a real thing, by the way. So when, you know, as schools have reopened or as uh, in some are in the, in the first stages in, in my part of the country, for example, and others have been in session for oh, you know, well over a month, you know, it's one of the questions, it's never too late or too early to ask the question, like as, as parents or grandparents, caretaking kids, you know, how should you prepare and how, what should you pay attention to as the schools reopen? Not so it's really, it's, you sort of say, you wanna be sure that you are up to speed and paying attention to the education, the supports in place, the vigilance that the school system's offering. Does that, does that make sense for you as, as an adult who yourself may or may not have a, a, a chronic condition or a medical problem? Uh, and then they, in turn, you wanna ensure that you and the school are watching your kids and that together you can understand that there's a problem that needs to be recognized or referred early as needed. Um, and then I think one of the things that we need to continuously work on as, a, you know, as in the medical sphere, in the medical sphere, but especially in partnering with schools is really holding schools accountable to re-engineer how information is delivered. So, you know, probably like a once a week email may not be enough. Um, calling the teacher on their cell phone is probably too much. So what's the Goldilocks happy balance for kids who have services or who have unmet needs? there's a harder question of how those services are accessed um, in the remote sort of realm. So namely, if you have a child who's nonverbal or who has autism and doesn't do eye contact or socio communication really well, like they have a hard time connecting with people, sometimes the screen is God's gift. Uh, when you're at home, there's no distraction. Other times you can have kids who have exactly that setup and they're just to it. They need to have a human connection or some other sort of level of stimulation or support to keep them on task and engaged. So I, it's, it's perilous to sort of say, here's my five point plan to make all kids work because surprise here, kids are really different. Ages and stages, needs, developmental background, medical issues, the family matrix, other things like uh, elements like culture and language, the kids' um, temperament and their, their their learning strengths and their learning weaknesses, all of those things go into the mix. And we have to look at you know, each kid holistically so that I really can't say there's a cookie cutter solution to all of our problems. Would that I could, I'd be on my fourth book. I'm not. Uh, so I think here, um, I think I gave you guys the shorter deck here, which is fine. So I'm gonna circulate amongst you a, um, uh, I have here some, some uh, a list of a list of resources. I'm going to kind of walk you through. I'm not going to go through the links. I promise. You know, but there are things like um, personal protective equipment for families and sort of what's appropriate and for like little kids wearing masks, for example. Um, lots of questions around social distancing at, at different ages and stages. So, you know, how do you do infants versus toddlers versus preschoolers? And we can talk about that if you have a question. You know, uh, questions around school shutdown and mental health. Um, things like sleep. Um, for kids who are, are having trouble making the transition back, uh, I will welcome your questions around things like separation anxiety, transitioning back into a routine. Um, we can delve into the medical pieces around what's the effect of kids as spreaders or kids who are asymptomatic and how do you tell? And then what, if anything, to do as a family if you haven't accessed things like uh, immunizations or vaccination catch up or say a flu shot for your child and what is, what's the thinking about that? So I think that's pr the bulk of what I have in the deck that I think you guys have here. So I'm, um, why, Zan, why don't we turn it over to questions and we can take it from there. I think you're on mute there. That sounds like a good idea. Um, so there is a chat function here. If anybody has any questions to type in there, I'm not sure that we can hear from you, but I would love to have some typed ones. I know that a, a couple things that, um, you know, we, we got uh, in, in questions that came beforehand. One was this idea of uh, 
kids getting stressed out because you're stressed out because they're stressed out and the sort of this cyclical really dangerous sort of just snake eating its tail cycle of uh of stress um so what are ways that parents can help deal with their own stress about schooling and everything that's happening with distance? Sure. Why don't you, is there a, um, I might answer that differently depending on the age and stage of the kiddo. Do you have like a, do you Let's have see. any specificity on that? I'm, you know, I otherwise, can't get a I specific can age on that, but I think that, I think that we're looking probably mostly at like elementary age kids. Sure. Sure. So if you have a kiddo who's stressed, so, um, why, why might that be? So we talked just in this very quick overview in terms of like what might be drivers of kids feeling uncomfortable? What might be, why might, why might there be children who are feeling stressed? And I think as we often learn and as we often, we don't say often enough probably in, in the medical world, it's like parents know their kids best. So if you have your child and there's something eating them and you've approached them and they can't quite define it, then think about other ways they're manifesting their stress. And so for example, some kids are gonna say, I'm sad when I go to school. Okay, that gives you something to work with. Other kids are saying, my stomach hurts, or I have a headache, or I wanna come home because I don't feel good. And so you have to sort of say to yourself, is there something medical going on? Do we have to go to the drive up COVID center? Or is there something eating them that might be fear-based or anxiety-based? So if you if you arrive at the latter, if you sort of have are, are arriving at the fact from your detective work that we all do as parents, that something's wrong and your kiddo is stressed, then I think you have to then turn it around and think, what motivates your child and what is something, what makes them happy? And so I think to the extent that you can in the pandemic world, um, as long as it's reasonable and it's not like buying Cadillacs or um, expensive sports cars, uh, that it's something that is like um, accessible to you, then find ways to, to access that. So for some kids, if it's like riding their bike, if that makes them happy, go for it. If it's for some kids, it's just, you know, actually and honestly, just together time with a parent or a grandparent or caretaker, sometimes then being creative and um, and dedicating, carving out time to be together, being intentional about it. And so maybe, and then maybe even um, there are books that you might read together and make that a very special time and an unspecial time. And that during the time of all this uncertainty and, and with, with, with living at work and work at home, um, that you can carve out some time and maybe even go to an outside space park um, down the road to the playground or just for a walk around the block and listen to a podcast together, um, do some of the, the kid yoga classes that are available on YouTube or podcasts. Like those might be ways goofy or silly to decompress and de-stress. And you may find not on the first time probably, but after a few sessions, these things may provide a window in where the kiddo may surface or share what's going on. If it's more than that, if it's disrupting sleep or appetite or there's school refusal and they, they're kicking and screaming and won't go back to school, then it might be time to contact their primary care provider and seek if they need some child psych support. Definitely. Let's see if we've got anything else in here. Yep. So I'm looking at the chat, guys, while Jen, while Dan is looking. So if there's any other questions folks have, fire away. I'm at your service. So, right, okay, well, so here's, here's one that specifically gets into like younger kids and how younger kids do the best for learning. Um, you know, preschool kids and whatnot and the lack of play that they're getting with other kids. Um, what sort of effect is that having on kids right now, especially like younger children? I might break that into two parts, and then I see a question in the chat that I'll get to after. But I think, you know, first of all, there, there are some programs that have gone back into session, so they've come back in the back to school time, or there have been some childcare programs that have run for essential workers or never closed through the, for the duration. And I, my understanding or my sense is when schools are open, they're actually, I would hope that they're working towards building in time for play for kids. What's different is, in, in, the, in the programs I'm familiar with, uh, is that it's the nature and the sort of the casual way that kids can mix and congregate has gone away. So there's probably much more of an intentionality to cohorting kids and having different classes perhaps be in smaller size. So there's kids aren't commingling and mixing as much and lowering the possibility of spread for, for COVID, for example. 
So I think in that sense, there's fewer kids to play with because kids are working in smaller groups. I do believe, and I, I do think that for the, for the kids in session at, the, at schools run like this, it's harder. So it may be, at least while we figure this out in the fall or for, for schools already that have never stopped being um, open, that they're figuring out ways to, to get back to play. Play is how kids figure the world out, right? That's how they connect with their peers. That's how they make friends. That's how they problem solve. That's how they fail and recover. So I think play is an enormous part of childhood. It's, a, it's incredibly critical to good neurodevelopment and good sort of socialization. So I think if there's zero play going on, it might be time to have a, a chat with the director of a program or to maybe understand if you're just not seeing it in a way that you used to, because that may be different. Yeah, I guess that is there a way that as parents, when our kids aren't getting the play that they would normally have with other kids of their same age, is there yeah. a value in us getting down on our knees and really engaging with them in that sort of way that they would with other kids? Great question. I would say to a degree, yes. I think you don't, you can't be like the sun, the moon, the stars for your kid all the time because you probably have to pee once in a while and you might even have a job to do or like a meal to make depending on your situation, right? So I think. Yes, it's good that you might be the person who kind of kickstarts the session. You kind of like, you line up the Legos, you get the blocks out, you figure out where the bicycle is or where the jump rope might be or where the, where the sidewalk chalk is hiding. And then you do a couple of things and you can say at the outset, like, listen, I'm going to get started, then I'm going to step away. You go from there so that you are fostering play, but it's not play that's dependent on you. Because if, if it's all about you guys all the time as parents, then you're going to burn out and you're already probably feeling close to fatigued already. So I'm going to go to the chat. I have a couple yeah, of questions. Yeah, let's check yeah. out the questions. So, from Diana. From Diana, says, uh, my child is a new kindergarten and is already shy amongst peers. He's not eager to participate in Zoom meetings and completely freezes and put in a breakout room. Is there something that I should say or do to encourage him or is this a teacher or, or is this for his teacher or nothing to do? Great question. So one thing you might try is um, a, couple of, a couple of thoughts. Um, give him your phone and you go to a laptop in the other room and then you have like a practice Zoom call inside your house and you do it with each other. And then you can expand it to like grandparents or cousins or friends and, and have a Zoom call with a friend. So essentially get him come on the platform if he isn't already. And if he is, if he's, if he's done it, he just kind of freezes with strangers. And I think that's where I think a call to the teacher is 100% appropriate. Like he or she may not be aware that, you know, it, it's harder on these screens when everyone looks like the Brady Bunch. Uh, the teacher, once alerted, might be able to find ways to draw him out. So I might try those things first to start. And if that's not working or if it's really blocking his ability to participate, then I think, um, you know, I think a more in-depth conversation with the teacher or perhaps school psychologist if there is one in his program. I see. Any advice for helping a six-year-old get some value out of remote learning when he hates the computer? <laughs> oh, is that all? Yeah. Okay. Well, seriously, he gets especially frustrated when the teacher who isn't computer literate has technical issues. Yeah, this is hard. I think... Uh, I, we used to call my daughter, my youngest, like sort of the, like the cranky end user, like with the minute when the tablet froze, you know, there was almost an urge to throw it on the ground and smash it. And I, I have met children who've actually done that. Um, I think that is, there is a certain amount of screen brain I think kids get, but that we all get to some extent that we're on task and things don't work well that in the way that we expect, we get frustrated. I think this is... Um, this is a classic example of like just sort of good positive reinforcement. I would talk about it with him. I might even video him, not to be shared, but just sort of video him in the moment and then watch the video with him and talk about it. Like what we're feeling and how and what was going on and how much you do that differently because we really don't want to break the computer because we only have one of them. Um, and then the next time you catch him doing a good deed of like working through it or sort of like taking a breath, counting to three, uh, you call them out, call them out for doing a good job. That is, you know, that's good. That's how they train killer whales. That's how spouses train each other. That's how we help our kids get to a better like behavior pattern. You reinforce the positive and then he's much more likely to do it the next time. I think yelling is certainly an impulse we all feel, I'm guilty here, but it is far less effective. Research bears that out a hundred times, uh, times a million. I see um, a question from Aaron. Um, great. This one, I, I relate to this one really well, like with the, the yeah. third grader and recapping math. Uh, yeah, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. no, no, that's okay. And I, this, yeah, this is, I 
I think a theme we're all familiar with. I have a third grader who lost a huge portion of lessons due to closing last year. And now my daughter is so lost starting third grade level math. I was hoping they did some recapping of the previous year, but they haven't. I don't know how to address this. Okay, so this is, this is there's a lot of, let's take this apart a little bit. This is, a, this is an important issue, which is not unique to you, Aaron, and I'm sorry that this is happening. I think a lot of kids, a lot of parents are feeling kind of lost. And so some people are calling this like the lost year, right? So spring was kind of a like march down the clock until school's over and then summer we get to take a breath and we're gonna hope that it's all over by September <laughs> and it's not. So so I consequently, I think we have to do a couple of things as parents in situations like this. So one is um, if, you, if you haven't already, if you haven't gotten a thousand emails, um, uh, then to maybe go to the school and ask the teacher directly, like, listen, is there a curriculum for um, whatever the particular subjects of struggle are? Because I'd like to understand where you guys are. And then in that way, you can be like the showrunner or the producer in the background. You can be the Zan of this of her experience where you're not telling her what to do, but you are aware of the pacing and what's next. And that you can also be available or you can even bone up if you have to to help her on the out of class work. Um, I think in turn, I think it's uh, important that you hold the school accountable a bit. So, I mean, if there's gonna be a proficiency test at some point, you need, to, you need to ask the teacher like, okay, so we did or didn't have a successful spring last year, but there's there are goals or learning levels that are expected by say November or December. What happens for those kids given all that we're in here what happens? Is everyone a pass fail? Does everyone get a does everyone get a mulligan on this? And I think that is, I think you you will benefit from clarity there. And honestly, the school committee may not have even figured it out yet. But ask the questions because if you don't ask, you won't know. So I think it's really being an advocate and stepping up and starting that dialogue. You might begin with an email, flip it to a Zoom or phone call if you need to go deeper. I, I do believe for teachers who are already very busy. Do anything where you're sort of ping-ponging an email more than sort of back and forth three times, call. No one has the thumb energy or time to type more than that because they have all those other kids too. Be kind to those teachers because they're working hard too. More questions, Let's keep them coming. Well, I know at least another question that like kind of is a pretty common one here is, and you, and you spoke to this a little bit there about just no longer asking people how much time they're spending on screens, but there is a you know general anxiety about any damage that might be caused by our kids being on screens so much more than they ever have been, or if they already were on them a ton, the fact that it just is unending. I worry about it, you know? Yeah. So I think, um, I think we're doing the best we can. It's we're all in this lifeboat and we don't have a lot of other options. I think for some parents, I'm, I'm not espousing making all kids, you know, sort of like, uh, subject to the one-eyed babysitter of the screen forever. I think that's not obviously not op optimal. I think optimal is kids, human beings in an interactive setting in in person. Until that time, though, this is our next best tool. So, you know, some families are have resources and can pay or um, employ a person to sort of be a homework nanny or have changed their nanny's job to be more of a kind of a monitor. Um, so for kids or precept them while they sort of do their lessons and, and keep them on task, most families don't have access to that kind of resource. Would that we did, but we don't. So I think in that sense, I think it's 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 far be it for me to pass judgment on a, an, an enormous social experiment. So I think we have to do our best. And I think if that means kids have more screen time than we ever expected or ever recommended, well, I think that's what we have to do until we get on the other side of this. Is there the anything... Can. Is there, I was going to say, is there anything more than just getting to the other side of it? How can we use that to our advantage since we don't really have the option of getting away from it? Um, I think I, uh, that's a good question. Like what's like best practices? What's good hygiene? I think it's like this. So we, we talk a lot in work and medicine where we're doing televisits and spending like a lot of folks who are telecommuting or teleworking. We worry about flat butt syndrome. I think it's true for kids. You know, I think like our buttocks are becoming horizontal given the fact that we're sitting all the time. So I think, I believe that children need to get up. We, we adults do too. We're not really in, meant to sit for so long. And Zoom classes are seem to lead so far, in my observations and in my discussions, there's a lot of downtime and sit time for kids. So 
when there's a five minute break for like a for a potty break or a bio break for kids, it I, on like no joke, it might be a seriously good idea to get your kid to run down the stairs, run around the house two times and get back on their chair before class is back in. Like just get them. It's it's almost like a high intensity workout. Um, but it gets the blood running, it gets it's good for them, it helps their concentration, it helps their energy overflow. And if you haven't already, maybe have some kinetic toys that they can kind of fiddle with to help their overflow energy from from being um, sitting so long in their house. This is not their site of learning and it, it's been repurposed. There's a question from Helen there about what's, what kind of issues you're seeing in your clinical practice and sure. if there's anything for parents to be proactive yeah. about and monitoring what's going on with their kids. It's a great question. So I think one of the biggest areas, Helen, is um, seeing kids with behavioral problems and depression. This is a little more prevalent in older children. It's somewhat, um, more pronounced in kids who perhaps had a predilection or a tendency to be depressed or sad or anxious. So um, for example, kids who maybe had separ a separation issue or an early childhood trauma, it's been reactivated by just the disruption and the uncertainty of the pandemic. And so a lot of those kids uh, are disconnected from services that they maybe used to get in school. Older kids, teenagers are feeling that, you know, essentially they're not getting the they're not getting the experience they thought they were entitled to, you know, to go to, to go to high school, to see their friends, to hang out. And so they are there. If little kids are social, teenagers are hyper social. So for them, this is anathema and super difficult. So we're seeing a lot of teens who are having, um, you know, frustration in terms of being able to you know, navigate this, this situation without getting really sad or, or they're, it's manifesting in that they're not sleeping well, they can't focus. And it's, it's disrupting their ability to apply themselves in their work. And so for parents, you want for whatever age, early on, I think it's it's like, I would call it developmentally appropriate for kids after this long, six month long um, sort of period, going back to school to be a little off their game. They might be a little fragile. They might be a little tender. They might have tantrums more often. Give them some room. And like, and let them kind of collect themselves and come back and give them a hug, and then you can send them back into the ball game essentially. So that that's not unusual, um, but you know, it's when that persists beyond a couple of weeks, and they're really not finding their way, way out of those woods, and the teachers aren't able to do it, or your conversations are not resolving it. Those would be kids their primary care provider, or perhaps a behavioral health professional working in the school system. Let's see, uh, from Diana. I worry about the ergonomics of it to some degree. <laughs> but we have a children with uh, neck issues, right? Um, or is this just a glimpse in time that won't happen because they're not able? Uh, it's a great question. It's probably more likely that kids of this generation are going to be nearsighted and need glasses like I do now. Um, when you are sort of looking at something super close up for a, an extended period of time and you're not looking up to exercise your CFAR muscles, it tends to make us nearsighted and our eyes have a harder time what they call accommodating to close up reading. So all this screen time in this generation will explain higher eyeglass costs in a few years time. So that's one thing you'll see. Um, kids who slouch, kids who sit in gaming chairs, kids who like sit in bean bags uh, and are doing so for their school day, I do believe that they're probably malleable and are not so much of a problem. It would, it would cause me some discomfort, let me tell you but probably not a big deal for a 10 year old or a 15 year old. Just reminded me to straighten my back out a little bit here and right. not Wait. not just slouch down here and actually look up again. Yeah, eat your vegetables too while you're at it, will you? Okay, all right. Follow up from Helen there about her teen who's depressed and anxious and constantly on screens and wondering if whether melatonin is a good idea for her to be on. Yeah, you know, melatonin is benign as long as you are clear what you're doing with melatonin, right? So melatonin is not a panacea. It's not CBD oil. It's not marijuana. It's like a, it's a mild supplement that may help sleep onset. And so it helps you fall asleep. It doesn't help you necessarily stay asleep. And it doesn't fix the other things which might be underlying why you're having sleeping problems in the first place. So not knowing your daughter, I'm not going to tell you what she has. So I'm not going to go all Dr. Phil on you necessarily. But I, but I would say in the context of this time and in all seriousness, I'm sorry that if she's feeling depressed, and I'm also sorry if she's feeling anxious. That's a serious matter. That isn't funny. And I think that uh, she deserves our sympathy. And I think she, you know, it's 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 a it, 
there can be a, almost an academic discussion of a chicken and egg, like did the screen maker depressed or is she on the screen because she's depressed? It doesn't really matter. I think it's, um, it's more a matter of engaging with her as, as able and as you can, if you can, in terms of like what's, you know, what's making her sad, if she is, even if she's able to articulate it. And some kids can and some kids can't because they're not sure. And, they're probably, and it's probably really frustrating as a consequence. And then past that, it's a, it might be a matter of getting her to talk to somebody. And you might begin with your primary care doctor or uh, perhaps a mental health professional. I hope she feels better. I want to ask a bit, and this is something that that I'm experiencing in my my own time is is the how can I work to get my kid back on task? Because I, you know, obviously we can't monitor everything they're doing the entire time. If you're home and you're trying to work and your kid is trying to do their schoolwork, you have mm -hmm. to afford them at least a little bit of autonomy to take care of things. Mm -hmm. But keeping them on task can be really difficult as well. And that's something I really struggle with. Sure. You know, she'll find the one thing that she enjoys doing and then won't stop. Ah, okay. Well, I love that she loves something. That's, that's great. That's a lever. Yeah. Right? You find the levers you can pull and then you sort of, you don't, you can't use it all the time, but it's a great incentive. So, so there's lots of ways to do it. I think you have to, you have to be like, anytime you're trying to incentivize, whether you have a little kid, you're trying to train potty train, or you have a school age kid, you're trying to get to like, sit for 30 minutes and, and complete their homework assignment, or if you have a teenager who has like four classes and an essay to write, and you want them to get their work done before they go out with their friends on a weekend day. So the idea is you can offer some kind of like milestone reinforcements on their way there, like a, like a waypoint on a longer journey. So if I have to walk 100 miles, that's depressing. But if I know every 20 miles, I get my favorite beverage, I'm going to be a little happier about that trip. So if you can offer them little things and make some, make some of them scheduled and make some of them like happy surprises, like a study break, basically, um, that you can bring them a snack. You can you can um, you can work with them on over the week. Like if they can do, uh, if they don't um, get up out of their chair, or if they if they get a good report by like Wednesday of that week, you can build like a video game. You can sort of like make it easy and then a little harder and a little harder. You can, I think, cultivate their motivation um, as long again you knowing what motivates them, uh, and then um, I think build on it, you know, and I think you have to be reasonable. You can't sort of say like, I'll give you 50 bucks if you um, finish your crossword puzzle. Um, good luck with that, or I'll meet you at the bank. But uh, I think if you can find things like for little kids, like sticker charts or making marks on the calendar, and then they get to pick dinner or they get to pick dessert, like those things can be, can inject a little fun into the work of getting this new experience down. And let's remember together too, everyone was sick of Zoom in June, you know, right? So we kind of arrived back on scene. I wouldn't say PTSD, but certainly like the novelty, the, the honeymoon's over, right? So this is hard. It's like putting on that wet swimming suit on a warm day. You know, it's like, ugh, this doesn't feel good. So I think the kids themselves are settling back in and they have to get back up and running. So everyone's a little cold for the first few weeks. Yeah. Sorry for the swimsuit analogy if that upset anybody. I see there's a screen blocking glasses legit. Um, uh, I, I don't think so. I'd save your money. I, I, I mean, I think like uh, they'd be far more prevalent if it was, if they were really found to be that effective. Um, there probably are some people, a small subset who are very sensitive to the blue light on screens. Um, but, um, you know, I don't think we're all walking around with migraines. We haven't had an epidemic of that at this time. Uh, I'm seeing my son wants me to buy him V bucks for, to get some work done. He's threatening me. I'm not sure what that, I'm not, can you clarify Lisa? I don't even know what it's it is. Like, I think V bucks are like a Fortnite, like virtual dollar thing. Oh, I see. Okay. That's very, thank you. I'll appreciate the learning. I always learn something. Um, and I'm not really sure what, so like threatening is, that's probably not okay. Like it's, you know, holding his work ransom is, um, uh, you know, I think that's just, manipulation and, and doesn't that doesn't feel good to me I think I, I you may want to sort of change the conversation or change the dynamic here a little bit um and and I always sort of remind parents and and my own kids too like you know video games are not a human right they sure are a lot of fun but like you know it's 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 not reasonable to sort of like hold that in um as some sort of um uh, psychic um, prisoner to the family like I will I will not do my homework unless you get me a video game. 
I think that's kind of like the telescope looking through the wrong end. I think it's more like, hey, listen, you got to earn your video game. And maybe we'll start there. So maybe we have a couple of days with zero video game. And then you earn it back. And then once that's been done, like a like sort of like an honor system, if you can, you know, do a good job for a day, then you get this many minutes of play. If you can do it for a few days, then you can get back to sort of like maybe something reasonable. But I think you have to recalibrate here. I think threatening, um, I think threatening is a problem in my mind. I would I would ask him not to use that kind of language. It's nice that he does a good job, though. I'm delighted to hear it. <laughs> um. Hey kids, you know, listen, kids are kids are, and I, I, no no uh, no animus towards her son. I think I think a lot of kids are boundary testing and they're trying to sort of investigate like, what can I get away with? Like, I like doing this, but like kind of like your daughter's and like, but I don't like doing that. So I think um, it can be, um, you know, helpful sometimes to, to build on, on their desire. But if, you know, in Lisa's case, if it feels like, you know, he is acting super preoccupied with just video games or whatever the activity might be being online, being on, uh, on, on Snapchat, like it's, it's again. It might be. It might be time to sort of, um, sort of reset and re 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 level set the expectations about being a member of the household, having some other responsibilities, and possibly even parking lotting that 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 device and encouraging them to do something outside. So that could be uh, whatever programs are in session, a sport, um, church, whatever is I think accessible and um, acceptable to your family. And if that doesn't work, then I think getting some uh, consulting the uh, school or um, your primary care provider for some mental health support is not unreasonable. We are coming to the end of our time here. I don't know if there's any more questions out there. Maybe we could get one more in. Um, I know that, that away. I would, I would think to ask about potentially, and I think you, you mentioned this a bit before as well about the, difficulty for kids to get uh, normal assessments and things like that, even if it's just going to the dentist or whatever, but sure. how, how, how dangerous might it be for us to start to perhaps misdiagnose from home, like ADD and things like that, based on our kids' own frustrations and ability to get their work done. Sure. It's such a foreign and awkward situation that they're in. Zian, I'm really glad you asked that question. I think, um, let's just say, let's put it this way. Uh, when there's stress in the world, like if we're at war or if there's a natural disaster or something enormously momentous, we all have ADHD, right? We're all like inattentive and distractible and we're all feeling uh, on edge and it makes us less available to learn new information because we're trying to be vigilant. And so I think um, here we have a situation where we have an unprecedented and enormous amount of stress for all the reasons we talked about that um, you know kids are um, are just dealing with all this stuff or they're watching their parents deal with it and so they go to school and they're they're expected to, they're learning about geometry and they're like how can I worry about geometry when like I don't know if we're gonna have our house because we can't make rent and I heard them talking about it at the kitchen table or or whatever the reason is or there's food insecurity or they know their parents depressed or their parent is stressed. So those things are, I think, reasons for us to, to not overcall ADHD, but to understand that ADHD may not be the actual diagnosis, but a manifestation of underlying stress in our society and manifesting that way in our kids. And sometimes, as, I, as we say here, it shows that they're not learning because they're preoccupied. Other times it might be because um, something might be undiagnosed or that they're, they're, they've kept something inside and they don't know how to say it. So. Um, either through chats, and I find car rides are an extraordinary way for kids to feel a little disarmed and a little more frank. So drive around and talk. Um, or if that's not working and you, you are unable to engage with folks at school, then again, I think it's it, that's a good time for evaluation. My cat seems to agree. Definitely. Cats know. Cats yeah, that's right. Kind of stuff. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. That's I think that's one that, you know, I mean, and, and whatever the diagnosis, it might be as far as like, thinking sure. about something that your kid might be going through. I think just hearing that, you know, we're under high stress and it's not really changing. So we'll go with that. Great. Thank you so much for sharing with us. We really appreciate you having here and for everybody here next week, we'll be back again, uh, same time, same channel with Dr. Maypole. And we're going to talk sure. about reasonable risk assessment 
in a time of great grief and uncertainty. So kind of that, as our relative isolation continues, what kind of concessions are we willing to take on uh, to try to get back some semblance of what our lives were like before? What kind of risks are we gonna take? Is it worth it for the rewards or how should we navigate those rough waters there? Um, Great, and I see, I see yeah, you know, one, one last question here. Yeah, like, yeah, let's do it. If you, a, if you have a seven-year-old who's feeling very passive during class, I might ask the teacher to um, to call on the seven-year-old and maybe, and, and, and just sort of say, like, don't embarrass them, but just sort of like try to draw them out of their shell and then, and, um, and get them to respond. And I think like we talked before, you know, re, you know re, lavish praise or, or, and report back if, if they, if they do, if they do respond. But I'll, uh, I'll respect everyone's time. I'll end here. But thank you, Zan, and thank you, everybody. Everyone stay safe, and I look forward to, to chatting next week. Thanks, everyone. Indeed. Thank you, Jack. Uh, again, the list of links that was at the end of the presentation there will get sent out in our follow-up email after this. Great. Everybody have a lovely night. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks.